Hey folks, welcome back to another Peach Planet podcast. Jason Pye joined as always by Scott Turner and Buzz Brockway. Guys, Hello. how you doing? Hey you champs, yes. I mean, you know, if you had a real program, and I judge real program by, you know, college football, uh, <laughs> you know, you guys were running that middle school offense for the longest time and, <laughs> and it, you know, it worked, it worked for a while, but once everybody, it worked well for a while, but once everybody figured out what you guys were doing, you know, Paul Johnson couldn't win a game. It's, it's a new era on the flats. My right? favorite, my favorite thing about tech fans was every year they would go two and oh, cause they beat St. Mary school, of the blind and deaf twice. <laughs> and you guys, you guys were like, oh, we're going undefeated. We got you guys this year. We're oh, gonna, give me a break. We're going to beat the Bulldogs this year. How, all right. How, how, how many, how many times every year, Georgia is the preseason national champions. And uh, since 1981, we've been hearing that. Oh, they, oh yeah. They're going to, this is, this is the year we're loaded. We got the best. We got more talent and we're going to whoop Alabama. Never happens. Except for the Ray Goff years. Let's just, let's just never speak of those years again. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, yeah, you, you look like you're about to say something. Just say it. No, you'll notice that my mouth is absolutely shut as a Florida State fan uh, in an extended period of rebuilding and several coaches. Uh, no, I don't really have a leg to stand on, so I'm just going to shut my mouth and let you guys find it out. I don't have a leg to stand on either, but I'm never. I'm not going to uh, pass up an opportunity to dump on the dogs. Uh, Listen, that, can we all just agree in our common and, and come together over our common hatred of the Florida Gators? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, we're fine. good. We're good. We're friends. <laughs> <laughs> See, so, look at me bringing people together. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've had, we've had a, an interesting, another interesting week in Georgia politics. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just a couple days ago, our uh, Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan had a, had a good piece uh, in national review. I go, well, I guess that wasn't, couple days ago i guess it was today uh, today yeah i had a good piece yeah. of national review and we also heard uh that lieutenant governor duncan one of his i think his chief of staff i think or deputy chief of staff said he he was unlikely to run for re- re-election again mm-hmm. are you hearing who it was that actually leaked it because i can't track it down like i thought the ajc because i covered it the I, ajc I, I, said a a uh a highly placed aide is how they described the person <laughs> um because i listen uh, and that could be anybody. That could be a friend of mine, right? Or, and a buzz. We have lots of friends who work over there. We have a couple of friends who are very close with us, and we talk to you all the time. Uh, the the nature of the leak was kind of like he was being pushed out, not given the option to make the decision for himself. That's what it appeared to me. Interesting. I I, I don't remember from reading the AGC story, but I did I did write about it briefly on PeachFunded.com yesterday. Not really giving a lot of uh, opinion because I, you know, and I think the three of us here all have a, have an admiration of Lieutenant mm-hmm. Governor Duncan and the way he's handled his job. And he just seems like a no nonsense guy, which I appreciate, but uh, it seems, it seems like he is, seems like to some degree, it seems like he kind of had it up to, you know, here with <clears throat> some of the shenanigans we saw, not just post November, the yeah. November election, but even in the legislative session, refusing to preside over the consideration of one election bill, mm-hmm. uh, not bringing up the Delta tax uh, credit elimination or tax uh, excise tax exemption for consideration. It seems like he's he's very tired of everything. And then and then now his piece in National Review kind of ex- sort of went after both Donald Trump and Joe Biden mm-hmm. for you for using Georgia as a political football. Yeah. So which one, I don't know, which one of you guys wants to go first? I haven't, I didn't see the piece until Buzz said it over earlier. The, the language that he uses in the piece, I think it's a USA Today piece, if you're going to go look for it. He, he National very, Review, National Review. Na- National Review, okay. Yeah. So I, I read two different pieces, one by Secretary Rasper, well, maybe we'll talk about that later, but the, but the Duncan piece uses from fairly incendiary language. You know, he basically goes straight at both presidents and lays this, um, this culture of, of kind of toxic politics at the feet of both of them and kind of draws a really bright line of, you know, this is not how we should uh, t- do politics in general. And secondly, there are real impacts for real human beings. But taking the all-star game, you know, we can debate and argue whether or not the economic impact numbers are accurate or whatever, um, but it has an impact on some people. And to ignore that human impact for the sake of creating a political narrative is something that, uh, you know, Jeff ran on, you know, Lieutenant Governor Duncan as a candidate when he was former representative and candidate Duncan, you know, his tagline was policy over politics. Mm -hmm. 
And he really hammered that home again and again and again. And so when you see, and I think that's what you've seen govern his reaction to the election results and the subsequent level of debate that we've had is that that mentality of we're going to look for the best policy and we're going to set the politics aside. Well, it's really difficult when you have this hyper-partisan um, Stacey Abrams and Donald Trump and, uh, and uh, anybody that wants to run against Brian Kemp, you know, creating these, these type yeah. of narratives. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was, it, I, it, it was, he was drawing a bright blue line. I don't know what you guys think. Well, I mean, well, one of the lines he uses, it's just one paragraph. Unfortunately, the beginning of the end of the 2021 MLB all-star game began here, be, uh, being here in Georgia started in the wee morning hours of November 4th, 2020. That is when the quote, great hoax, supposedly began in this state for nearly 10 weeks former president donald trump intentionally disrupted life here for the sole purpose of trying to overturn a fair and legal election he spared no expense in his efforts twisting turning and stretching and last but not least ignoring the truth that is strong yeah i mean it was the language he used was very powerful and i'll just want one more point for throwing it over to buzz you know the the um all right go ahead buzz (laughs) Well, no, I think your your assessment of Jeff is right. He he, he Lieutenant Governor Duncan. Um, it's it's hard ran, for us to say that. <laughs> yes, he ran on that platform that that Scott mentioned, policy policy over politics. He's tried his best to stay true to that. It's tough. You it's you can't you can't really take politics out of politics, and so you know as 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 friends of his, they, there have been decisions that he has made that we have uh, not always agreed with, but on the whole more than a lot of other uh, elected officials in, in Georgia history, he, is, he has stayed true to that attempt, at least, to, to place policy over politics. And I think that's what you're seeing now. He, you know, whether he decides to run, which it, it looks unlikely that he will run again, I, I think what you're seeing with, with this article and with other things that he has written lately, what he's trying to do, he, he's got this website, he's got this organization he's formed called GOP 2.0. He talks about uh, you know, changing the tone and focusing on policy and, and having empathy be a part of, of how we do things. I think he's going to try to uh, cast a vision for what he thinks the GOP and conservatives should be doing. And, and what you saw in that article, he, he's not afraid to call out either side. He, you know, he was, he was pretty strong uh, dur- at the time. He, this isn't just an after-the-fact situation. He was pretty strong in the, in the days right after the election calling out things that he thought Trump was doing wrong. And uh, now he's saying the same to Biden and Stacey Abrams, who, as he points out in that article, uh, it, it's their lies and, and that have that led the uh, Major League Baseball to decide to move the All-Star game elsewhere. And uh, I guess we should mention that it, it appears, we, we mentioned a little bit about that the number of conversations, apparently Stacey Abrams was involved in conversations with uh, top brass at Major League Baseball around that time the decision was made. And apparently as were LeBron James and his people uh, uh, making it clear to Rob Manford that the All-Star game, if it were going to be in Atlanta was going to be one giant protest and right or wrong. And, you know, we we're baseball fans and, you know, we want, I want it here. And as Scott mentioned, there is an economic impact to this. Uh, Manford just decided I'm, you know, I'm out of here. Uh, Cause I don't want to, I don't want to yeah. provide that forum for that. So. So let me go ahead. Buddy. No, that, that was it. I, I think, you know, and I think Jeff Duncan's trying to, trying to lay the, you know, make the case, all of this stuff, whether it comes from Joe Biden uh, telling, telling absolute falsehoods and Stacey Abrams telling absolute falsehoods about uh, this piece of legislation or Donald Trump talking about the, uh, the, the, uh, you know, the stolen election, it's all contributing to toxic politics in yeah. our country. Well, one thing, one thing, hold on. I, I want to go back for a second because, because I think Scott, you're the one who said you kind of wondered whether Duncan was being told not to run for re-election. Uh, you know, it, it, it would be, it would be, I don't know what you meant by that, but I do want to, I do want to revisit that for a second because I, I do think if, if there is a sacrificial lamb to be offered, you look at Kemp 
Duncan and Raffensperger. Duncan was is the one who, who in the eyes of the conservative voters should be the least guilty. Uh, sure, you know. Right. But so I mean, but you know, if, I don't know if that's what's what's happening here or not. But Duncan, I think, is the one who's. I mean, look, I, I, I yeah, I, I understand the the two of you have relationships with all these guys, but Duncan, from my perspective, is the most honorable of the three. Not to say that Kemp is not or Raffensperger is not honorable. I'm just saying the way he has conducted himself, I appreciate. I, I'm not going to get into ranking them for sure. Um, you know, I, I will say that uh, what I meant by those comments earlier when I couldn't chase down because the source is not named right in the AJC article saying, according to a, a, a highly placed aide, that Jeff is not likely to run again. Well, anonymous sources speaking on background with information that they know yeah, nothing about. Yeah, right. I mean, who is that person? And yeah. were they authorized to speak on Jeff's behalf? What is Jeff saying, by the way? Uh, I had a conversation with Lieutenant Governor the day after Signy die. And uh, I don't think I'm out telling tales out of school. I asked him point blank if he's running again. And he didn't say no. You know, he he was talking about going to focus and being with his family and things like that, which, you know, it can go either way at this point. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't blame him if he walked away based upon how things are, but uh, I don't know that it's in the bag that he's leaving either. And I think it's way too premature for us to uh, add so much value to the statement of an anonymous source again, you sure. know, and, and make these decisions that Jeff isn't running again. He may very well do that and it'll be up to him you know, I do think it'll be a tougher row for him to hoe because he has very clearly drawn a big, bright line that he's, you know, on the other side from the former president. Yeah. And the former president has a very strong following but he, within the Republican Party. They, the, yes. But at the same time, the, uh, the can there is no serious can candidate who's announced against him. Now, that could change. Right. Yeah, right. We, there, is we, a, there is one candidate, but I would also say that not a very serious uh, uh, challenge, yeah. but I would challenge yeah. the two. I would challenge the both of one or one or both of you to, and I can even text him as well. Try to get him on the show so we can talk to him about it. Oh yeah, we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna get you. Jeff. We'll, Jeff, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. that. Uh, you, so uh, turning, I, I don't want to. I don't want to go into down into uh, the rabbit trail of Georgia politicians who had op eds op eds recently. But I understand that Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger who is facing uh, two primary challengers, yeah. one, including a sitting U.S. congressman who cannot transfer the money from his FEC, uh, his FEC, his federal account, to a state yeah. account. He has to raise all new money. Uh, also had a, uh, an op-ed this, uh, well, I guess in the last week, uh, not this week per se. I think he had one, I forget the name of the publication, but I know it's AEI's uh, publication. Yeah. Um, National National Journal, uh, which is a pretty, I mean, generally it's a, it's a, pretty serious publication they they talk about deep things and it it seems to be in conjunction with an event that will be held at AEI next week i don't know if brad will be there secretary raffsberger excuse me will be there in person or if he will uh you know be tuning in by zoom but uh it will be interesting and, and the the subject of the article and of the talk are how republicans and democrats are undermining faith in our elections and uh, it, it's a you know it's it, it's it's noteworthy because it's it's a similar vein, similar thinking. Two different guys who lived through that post-election turmoil, uh, and both uh, kind of came down on the same side of things. That that people in both parties are undermining faith in our elections. Yeah, and you know the language that he used was deja vu, right? He the he used the phrase deja vu to describe how he felt after Stacey Abrams had originally created this path for Donald Trump to go drive a Mack truck down, right? She, yeah. she like kind of blazed this trail and he was like, honk, honk, follow me, fellas. We're heading down the same road that Stacey yeah. paved <laughs> and claim that election was stolen. They both did that. And so the piece that Secretary Raffensperger, again, we call him Brad because we served with him so it's hard and, not and to. honestly brad's a whole lot easier to say than raffensperger no offense but yeah, yeah. i mean yeah so um that's geez, true I, I don't know could you get canceled for making that comment buzz i don't know probably I, yeah these days probably yeah but uh secretary brad uh is a friend <laughs> of go. ours and and you know his language that he used in that particular case was 
he, he created this imagery of, you know, it, it was the same feeling I had when Stacey Abrams did this exact same thing. And it's not cool when both people are doing it and it's the job of the secretary of state to run an election. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't really have any commentary except to say that I'm so tired of talking about the secretary of state's office that, <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's like the most, I would, I would office rather talk, that we about talk so tech. much about <laughs> <laughs> yeah i would rather talk about georgia tech basketball all day long because given we my hatred do that. Of basketball generally speaking not to mention the fact that it's georgia tech uh <laughs> there are so many other things i would rather talk about i would rather talk about alabama crimson tide football buzz uh, <laughs> well i mean since we're talking about sports how about the masters then i know that's on our agenda uh yeah. you know I, you know all the only thing i have to say about the masters is i drove back through augusta on sunday and and traffic was noticeably uh heavier than it usually is not to say <laughs> but it was still moving it was still moving it wasn't yeah. it, it wasn't like other parts of my trip back down from washington dc so the average person may wonder, why are you talking about the Masters on a Georgia podcast, politics podcast? And the reason why is, you know, we started out talking about the impact of sports and LeBron James threatening boycotts and Stacey Abrams calling Rob Manford and all these other issues. Well, the Masters just ran a major sporting event, one of the, one of the top four golfing sporting events in the world. And they did it in Augusta, Georgia, and no protests, no controversy controversy free the focus was on the tournament it was on the players it was on Hideki Matsusama who congratulations to you sir you did a great job uh, especially on that back nine did you see the picture of him in the airport with the green yes. jacket draped over the seat at Hartsfield that was awesome <laughs> right so <laughs> so proof that if you stick to your guns you know Augusta does this all the time every time they're threatened with anything they're just like well we're just gonna go play golf you know that's what we do we play golf y'all and, they, and they've about had it. They've had controversies before, right. and they've had protests. There, there was all sorts of attempts. Uh, I can't remember when it was, but some years ago when uh, they had no female members at that time, uh, and there, were, there was a, uh, an, a woman's organization who was uh, dogging them for years, yes. and uh, they, they just said, no. Nah, we we'll, we'll we'll might have a, a woman member someday, and we might admit women in the future, but it'll be on our timeline. Yeah. It'll be under the right. And they did. I feel like that was with, that was within the last 20 years. I yes, remember. I remember. It that. was. Yeah. I think 2003 is when it started to really heat up. And yeah. uh, the New York Times went after the New York Times ended up writing more stories about Augusta National not admitting women than they did about uh, Bill Clinton, I think. <laughs> and that's probably not true, but so, pretty close. But let, it, let, me, let me let me pause it my on my theory real fast. I mean, the reason there were no protesters there is because the closest airport. I mean, either way, no matter whether you were, you were coming from Hartsfield or Columbia, Columbia's got the closest airport. It's you know real airport, like a yeah. you know and like an hour and a half away. Atlanta is yeah. another two and a half hours, if not if not two two almost three hours away. Yeah. It's in the middle of nowhere on I-20. Nobody's yeah, nobody's guys, gonna make that trek. Listen, the All-Star game is one three-hour game. The Masters is four days long, and there were no protests. I mean, you could if they re, if it was really that important to them, they would have yeah. been out there protesting. LeBron James would have showed up. He there's a little regional airport there, and I know he has access to a private jet. He could have <laughs> flown in there and and led the led the crowd. Fair, fair fight action could have flown in all sorts Absolutely. of people. Absolutely. And you know, and don't think that there weren't fair fight action members actually sitting on the seventh green watching the putts, you know. <laughs> uh, they probably were there too. I hate I actually I would say I would rather talk about golf more than I would talk about the Secretary of State's office at this point. <laughs> and I really hate golf. Like like it's it like I would rather watch cr curling than watch golf or basketball that's, there's, there's a considerable amount of drama in curling i, I don't blame you is there there's curling leagues in atlanta you know i did not know that i didn't say i wanted yeah. to i didn't say i wanted to play cur play be a curler curler uh after spending six hours in my yard the weekend before last i was near death uh yeah i was pretty sounds tired. like you need to be on the ice you know <laughs> that's what it sounds like to me and apparently um lots of alcoholic beverages are consumed uh, oh, in the process of let's curling go. you so. and me buzz you and me let's go I, I don't buzz doesn't strike me as much of a drinker um no he doesn't so we we have a candidate in the u.s senate in the u.s senate race against Raphael warnock we might have more candidates uh up and coming obviously we have doug collins has been mentioned as a candidate kelly leffler has been men mentioned as a candidate uh, I've heard uh, both uh, this week, Buddy Carter and Drew Ferguson uh, as potential candidates. I think we've talked about Drew before, yeah. Congressman Ferguson. 
Uh, and then, of course, Congressman Buddy Carter, who does not strike me as a viable candidate, given the, his geographical location, uh, being down there in coastal Georgia. Uh, but we have a U.S. Senate candidate. He's an interesting one. His name's Kelvin King. He is, uh, I think he owns a construction company. He's also a person of color, uh, which would be uh, an interesting take on uh, if the Georgia Republican voters decide to nominate him next year. Yeah, and he's married to Janelle King, who is uh, honestly more well known within Republican activist circles than he is. And I was kind of thinking that maybe she would have made a more compelling candidate as a result of that. But, uh, you know, as it, Kelvin has a Facebook page set up. He has an introductory video. He's a likable guy and very positive in his messaging so far. And I think, you know, he's going to be, uh, you know, a, a strong candidate. I'll, I'll, I'll say this much. I'm still a little bit hesitant only because He's not run for office before, yeah. and it doesn't check that box for me. And so well, that, I, that didn't stop you from supporting Kelly Leffler, but uh, Scott. I mean, yeah. Well, <laughs> she didn't. She didn't run at that point. She was already sitting U.S. senator by the time I got around to. Uh, to still had, still her. hadn't run for office. <laughs> no, but you know, once you're doing the job, it's kind of different, right? Uh, the, Janelle King. I'm just. Is, I'm is, giving you a hard time, man. I'm giving you. Janelle a hard King time. is, is uh, again, uh, Mr. King. Kelvin King's yeah. uh, uh, wife, uh, she's on TV in the local Atlanta market all the time, mm -hmm. uh, talking about things from a um, African American Republican mm -hmm. female perspective, and it's, it's she's very intriguing. And so I, I think between the two of them, they make a fantastic power couple, and they're very influential within the party. And so I, you know, I, I'm excited to see what what they can come mm -hmm. up with, but I, I have to express a little bit of resonance about not having run for office. Before. Well, it's, it's, it's money is going to be the challenge. How much money can he raise? Uh, I mean, we're going to, uh, you know, to, to, to follow this thing all the way through to attempting to successfully challenge uh, the incumbent Raphael Warnock, we're talking tens and tens and tens of millions. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how expensive this raise is going to be. So can he, can he do that? Can he, can he raise enough money to get through there, given some of the names that you threw out? Uh, uh, Jason, that, you know, if Doug Collins gets in this race, for example, or Kelly Leffler decides to get in this race, you know, they're going to have a big following and lots of money. And can, uh, can Kelvin King, uh, you know, raise that money that he needs to be competitive? I think in, the, you know, if you can get through the primary, I think national money will come in and, uh, you know, GOP money will, will rally around him, but he's got to get in there. Having, you know, as, as a guy who ran statewide, You've got to raise enough money to 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 get over that hump and get become viable. So, yeah, and the, I think the money certainly, if he gets the nomination, there'll be tens of millions of dollars that come in the state through the form of PAC money, yeah. uh, at, you know, a five hundred one c four advocacy ads, things like that that come out of the woodwork. And but that money is going to be matched dollar for dollar, if not more, on the on the Democratic side. Because I mean, that's yeah. that's the thing. If you look through. I love how when politicians always talk about the, the money that comes from the right, because the right is substantially underfunded compared to the left. And yes. if you go if you go look at if you go look at the money that was spent in South Carolina, Kentucky, oh, uh, Maine, uh, and it's North Carolina as well. I mean, the Republican candidates in those states were were I mean, we're talking about Mitch McConnell, Tom Tillis, Susan yeah. Collins uh, and Lindsey Graham. They were outspent yeah. by, by it's, loads. It's insane amounts of money. That, that was spent. Uh, I mean, I, 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 may, I may, for some reason, the number 80 million sticks in my head for the candidate in South Carolina. Who, who it was more, it was, a, it, it was more than that. It was a, he had, uh, he raised on his own, I think at least a hundred million. And yeah. then he had, he had additional money coming in through the pack and you can find yeah. all that stuff at opensecrets.org, which I'm going to go pull up real fast. So keep talking boss. <laughs> well, I, I think, yeah, you, I mean, you're exactly right. And the Dem Democrats have done a, a tremendous job. They've, they've, what they've done is empowered, uh, you know, the, the person sitting in California who wants to support a, a Democratic candidate and realizes that their local Democrat or their state, their senator is going to cruise to victory. So why bother giving that person money? They've created a network with the ability to connect all the way down to state house candidates. So it's, it's an impressive system that they've done and they, that they have built. Republicans are, are only now trying to trying to build a similar organization. And as Jason mentioned, they're way behind uh, and it's going to take them time to to uh, 
to, to build up that kind of network. But yeah, it's, it's unlocked tens, you know, just unbelievable amounts of money. Uh, we had a state house candidate uh, in, in Gwinnett County, a state house candidate that had never run for office before, right out of the gate, raising sixty seventy thousand dollars for for a state house race, all money flowing through the Act Blue network. So it's 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 unbelievable. Yeah, Harrison raised one hundred and thirty and a half million dollars. <laughs> spent spent one hundred and thirty point two uh, million, and then uh, I will say this: Graham did have more money, outside money supporting him, almost seven and a half million dollars uh, compared to Jamie Harrison's $4.1 million. Harrison had, there was 23 point, excuse me, $26.3 million spent against Harrison from outside spending uh, compared to 13.3 uh, spent yeah. against Graham. But Harrison, Harrison had the numbers game. When you add it all up, Harrison, yeah, yeah Harrison had a lot more money. It's yeah, it's it's in, unbelievable. And the, the, the Senate race, uh, Raphael Warnock is going to have that kind of money and Republicans are going to have to see you know, how much money they can raise to match, to yeah. be competitive. No, it's good. It's going to be it, it's going to be interesting. But I, I tell you right now, and, we, and we've discussed this before on the podcast. Yeah, I think someone like Kelvin King, you know, is is the candidate Republicans need in Georgia. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you need someone like that. If you run, if it's going to, if it's Leffler, if it's Collins, and I don't say that because of my dislike of Leffler, I like Collins, but he's not the type of person you yeah. want to have as your nominee going into what is going to be, you know, an identity politics election. Well, I and think what's that, interesting mm -hmm. about him, uh, it's, sorry, Scott, if I could just ahead, make this point real quick. He's a Trump friendly Republican who is, as best I can tell, has not been uh identified with some of the fringier elements of trump's coalition but he's a trump friendly republican so if you're a trump loyalist you probably would not have a problem uh you know supporting uh calvin king uh but then as a businessman you know so his challenge is going to be can he can he broaden that can he as jason said can he get out there and beat the bushes and and bring in new voters to the republican party because that's despite what you know, I know we got a, a lot of Trump loving Republicans in this state They we ha you win elections by getting more votes than the other guy and uh, running people off and talking about how you're going to get rid of the rhinos and you're going to purify the party is not the path to victory. Right. And the, the intriguing thing about uh, Mr. King is that he is a clean slate. Right. So mm -hmm. there's no there's no record to pick apart. You know, he, he didn't vote against a hate crimes bill or for a, or against a, a heartbeat bill, you know. Mm -hmm. So there's a, you know, he can he can kind of create the mold of who he wants to be. Yeah. Uh, he did, though, uh, feature President Trump in his announcement video. Mm -hmm. So that, I think he probably is closer than just a little bit friendly to Trump. I think yeah. he's probably going to run under the banner of Trump from what I can see in his early early indications from his campaign but his his lack of a record scott i think is is one thing that's going to make him probably vulnerable because it gives the it gives the people who may run against him an opportunity to define him in a primary campaign uh, we've could seen be, that with we've seen that yeah, with if it, but it can be defeated right i mean we saw Raphael warnock who had no record um win an election by clearly pushing back on that so i mean the campaign uh, an effective campaign a well-run campaign that is able to anticipate and message against it, it's going to be fine. I, I, that's not what, what worries me. Um, the the lack of experience of being able to recognize those challenges is what worries sure. me. And, sure. And so going back to, you know, I know that you uh, had said on a previous podcast that, you know, you wanted to see a person of color or a female. I don't think Republicans are into the identity politics thing at all. You know, they're going to look at uh, Mr. King and they're going to discount his race. Uh, they're not going to take that into consideration. They're going to say, where does he stand on life? Where does he stand on guns? Where does he stand mm -hmm. on deficit reduction? Where does he stand on making sure my job is going to stay in the United States? Where does he stand on immigration? These are the things that are going to define him and make his candidacy viable, in my opinion. Republican primary voters do not take those things into consideration. Right. The consultant class does. Sure, but, they do. And, and yeah. general election voters do, right? You're trying to appeal to Metro Atlanta voters who have drifted away from the Republican Party, who would probably feel uh, a lot more co uh, more comfortable uh, voting for a candidate like Calvin King than uh, vote. No, no offense to Doug Collins, I'm a fan as well, but 
voting for yet another rural Republican uh, who who wants to talk about guns all the time. That's just the cold hard facts of things. Yeah. Yeah, but I think even for Mr. King's candidacy to be successful in order to win the, the primary, he's going to have to talk about those things. Mm-hmm. He's going to have to talk about guns. He's going to have to talk about Biden going to war uh, over over sure. your right to bear arms. And yeah. what he's I, going what to have I, to have an I, answer for that. My free advice to him would be, he, he's a guy who built his own business through his own hard work and, and has achieved, uh, I don't know how much money he has, but he's achieved a level of success. That's what I think has been missing from Republican candidates lately. They've got to talk about that. They've got to speak to people's hopes and dreams. And I think Ke- you know, Calvin King ha- is, is a candidate who could do that because he's lived that life. Just speak from his own experience about how he, he wants to bring the, the you know, he's, he's living his American dream and he wants to help everybody uh, live their American dream too, right. as opposed to you know, as opposed to Trump saying the American dream is dead. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll go ahead and put I'll go I'll go ahead and put this out there. You know, and and, and I'll give any one of us veto veto power over this. You know, I mean, this is a forum for for I mean, if it's just as much a yeah. forum for candidates as it is for other people for the three of us. We're three assholes who who work who who have either li- hey. who either live. I mean, Scott, come on, you're the worst. Um, <laughs> who either who either uh, wor- have worked in Georgia politics or, but we are definitely three politicos, and we we yep. we all contribute to a website, peachfunded.com. If yep. you're a candidate, and you want to come on and join us. Uh, if any one of us says no, that means you're done, uh, and you can't join. But like, if we we, we want to hear what you have to say, I yeah, mean, yeah. And, and I think because I think going into this election, look, I don't want to. I don't want to do the normal. This is the most important uh, election in our lifetimes because that that's getting old at this point in time to hear that every two years. <laughs> um, j- but at the same time, I do think that there's Georgia is going through a time of change, and yeah. the Republican Party is going through an evolution. Yeah. And I think I think a lot of us want to hear what candidates who have to say. And this mm. is a small forum for you to come on and and talk about your your candidacy yeah. and campaign and what you what you would do and maybe answer a tough question or two about certain issues. You know, I mean, I have the issues I'm going to, I want to ask about, which is budget and appropriations, criminal justice, civil liberties, and, yeah. you know, uh, trade and a few other things. And I know buzz education is a big one for me, yeah. for, for you, Scott, I know you have your issues. So, I mean, that's something I'll put. Whoa, 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 whoa. What are you trying to say? I political mean, issues, Scott. Right, political right, issues. Right. Okay, okay. Po- oh, yeah, I just want to make that clear. Political issues. I'm, I'm just. I mean, all I'm saying is I've never met a Reds fan who lives in Georgia. You know, Reds uh, fan. Scott's a Reds fan. Yeah, baby. Yeah. You didn't know that? I was born. I, in I did Cincinnati. not know that. You served with him for what three terms, and you didn't know that? No. Uh, right here, the '76 Cincinnati Reds are right there. Yeah. 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 Great team. Yeah. P. Rose over my right shoulder. When, when I lose another 10, 15 pounds, I'll be able to fit in my Pete Rose jersey again. And uh, <laughs> so, but we also have other rumors, rumors of other candidacies. Uh, Vernon Jones is one that keeps popping up. He's He might run for something at some point in time with an R next to his name. Uh, I know Governor has been talked about the primary challenge to, uh, potential primary challenge to Governor Kemp. Um, so what are you guys hearing? What's the latest on that? Well, uh, over the weekend, there was a meeting, I don't know, I guess it was an RNC meeting, uh, and Trump spoke, etc. Trump was there doing things. And uh, at one particular event, apparently, uh, Greg Bluestein, the AJC, reported this, had some video. Trump kept pointing at Vernon Jones and says, when are we going to hear your announcement that you're running for governor? And uh, uh, he uh, Vernon indicated that Friday there would be an announcement. He t- he has a website up now. Uh, he is uh, uh, talking about how he's going to be making an announcement about something. Uh, it sure seems uh, like he's going to run uh, for governor against Brian Kemp. This so. this coming Friday. Yes, this coming Friday. This coming yes. Friday. So this coming uh, Friday. God help us all. Yep. Scott, Scott, come on. You you know you want to say something, man. Uh, you know, Vernon was my seatmate for years, and um, you know, I, he had a tweet recently. I want to read it. Um, it was just a phenomenal tweet. Uh, you would have thought Vernon Jones was a lifelong Republican from this tweet. It said, "To destroy a heart simply because it's not big enough to beat is mind-numbing. 
life begins at conception, period, and it should be protected from that point and from that point forward. He's running for governor. So he's running. But here's the thing, right? <laughs> when given the opportunity to vote for the heartbeat bill three years ago, I sat next to Vernon Jones and watched him press his no button yep. instead of the yes button. Two and years ago, right? 2019? I thought it was the, I thought it was three, but uh, it, it, it's three sessions ago. So it was two not that ago. long ago. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't that long ago. It was just a couple years ago. Recent history. Recently, yeah. I watched him press the no button. I watched his finger reach down and press the no button when he had a chance to defend yeah. the, the unborn and the heartbeat bill. And not only that, but he gave very powerful quotes telling people that they were going to lose their chairmanships because the house of representatives was going to flip and there'd be a Democrat at the front of the chamber. Yeah. And he was so opposed to the heartbeat bill that was sponsored by Ed Setzler and ultimately became signed into law. It's currently enjoined, but was signed into law. He was so opposed that he actually gave speeches against it. Yeah. So this is somebody who has flip-flopped considerably on this issue. I'd like to, you know, if, since we're inviting candidates on, I would love to invite my former seatmate <laughs> on to explain himself. What do you mean by this? Why were yeah. just a, you know, less than a thousand days ago, you're, you were saying the opposite of this. Yeah. And, and so you're not fooling me, sir, because I sat next to you for, for five or six years. I know yeah. exactly where you stand on this issue and you weren't with us. You know, there were only a couple of Democrats that were, yeah. and they weren't named Vernon Jones. Yeah. It, it's, I mean, look, he's, he is, uh, we've talked about it before. He's a very charismatic individual. I, I, I totally understand why he has been elected to numerous offices, uh, but this is going to be a hard sell for him because of what Scott just mentioned. He's, he's better come up with some sort of explanation as to why things are different now than they were just a couple of years ago. And I, I don't know. I mean, I just, I don't know how he's going to pull that off. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and and my experience with him as well is when he gets questioned, he gets very defensive. So mm -hmm. his personality is, you know, all smiles until there's conflict. And once there's conflict, it's you're being disrespectful to me. And I don't have to take this. So I'm going to get up and walk out. You know, I actually was in a committee hearing one time. So he's Donald where, Trump, basically, what you're where, saying. Well, I mm -hmm. was in a committee hearing where he was presenting a bill about cityhood yeah. in DeKalb I'm County. There too. And he got up and walked out on his own bill presentation because he felt like the questions were too hostile and disrespectful. I mean, it was, yep. you, were you chairing that committee, Buzz? Yep. Yeah. I was chairing that committee at that yeah. time. That was one of the most bizarre things I'd ever seen because it wasn't Vernon's bill. Yeah, it was the, the author of the Billy bill. Had locked bill. Him. Yeah. He, yeah. He, the, the author had locked himself in his, in his office yeah. and wouldn't come out. And so Vernon, still, wait, 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 right. wait, let's wait, set, wait. Let's let's set the groundwork here. No, no, you got to tell that story before you finish the Vernon Jones story. <laughs> Buzz was Look, Buzz was the the chairman, so he's got more info than me. I just so, I was a committee uh, member. Wait, wait, Buzz, who did you piss off? Like you're the nicest person I've ever met. <laughs> it was it was a subcommittee. Okay, I was a subcommittee chair, and at that time in the legislature, Scott can attest to this. There were a number of cityhood proposals especially in DeKalb County. And so Representative Mitchell had a bill uh, to create, I, I can't remember, it essentially would have incorporated everything that wasn't already incorporated in DeKalb County. So it's a big, big area moving all around, would have landlocked a couple other cities. But as I recall, and Scott, you can help me, correct me if I'm wrong about this, some of the land that they wanted in the city would have taken land from already existing cities like Stone Mountain and Stonecrest, I believe. Yeah, and also and so some it was unincorporated Atlanta into cab. Yeah. yeah. And so they had property owners who loved their Atlanta address without having to pay Atlanta taxes that would be now in Greenhaven. And they were pretty yeah. upset too. So go ahead. Buddy. So all of that's going on. It was communicated by uh, Chairman Ed Reinders at the time. Look, if you want this bill to have a chance, it uh, you you ha you cannot grab land from other existing cities. Okay, you can't do that. Uh, and so the the day came for the hearing uh, in the subcommittee that I was chairing, and Representative Mitchell was nowhere to be found. And in walks Vernon Jones, <laughs> Representative Jones, with a new sub uh, uh, a new a substitute of the bill that not only did not remove the areas of other cities, but increased the land grab into other cities. 
and Vernon, uh, you know, gave an impassioned speech, and you know, it was it was a it was a wonder to behold. And as Scott mentioned, questions started coming, uh, not just from Republicans. All right, you know, you know Democrats were, uh, were were very uh, not not completely sold on this idea either. Uh, and so the questions started coming, and then uh, out he goes. <laughs> yeah, he, he got up and left in the middle of his own bill presentation. It was, and there were people calling Representative Mitchell, "Hey, where are you, man? Your bill is here. We got to have this meeting." Do you want your office. bill to be heard or not? And then in walks Representative Jones. <laughs> <laughs> With a okay. substitute to somebody else's bill to present it. And All then, right. Yeah. So well, that's, 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 uh, that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's what we're that's what we're looking at. And if you know, that's the type of, uh, should I use the word clown show? Yeah, I just did. If that's the type <laughs> of clown show we can anticipate. With a Vernon Jones for governor race. That's yeah. Good luck with the AJC when that happens. Uh, <laughs> so we, we have we have more uh, election SB two hundred two related uh, news. We had a story about yesterday. I think just yesterday that Will Smith, mm -hmm. uh, the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, has pulled a movie from being filmed in Georgia yeah. uh, for other locations because of the election law. Yeah. Uh, I, I'll be the first to say I really don't care that georgia i hate the tax credit i really don't care that georgia's getting all the the tv shows and movies that it's been getting i don't care uh so i, I would just say like if you if you're gonna like just if you're gonna boycott our state over over this and i again i'll go on record one more time saying i'm not a fan of the election law yeah if i were in the legislature i wouldn't have voted for it but can you take all of them with you can you take all the movies and tv shows <laughs> like either cup either either commit or leave well, the, the interesting thing about this is that, first of all, it's going to cost them $15 million to do this yeah. because that's the that's the subsidy that Georgia would have paid them to film the, the production here in Georgia. But secondly, they went to Louisiana. So that's where they decided they're going to pull stakes from Georgia and go to Louisiana, where in Georgia, you have an absentee um, process that allows you to have no excuse. You don't need an excuse in Georgia, but you need one if you're in Louisiana. <laughs> you need an ID to vote in Louisiana. There are fewer early voting days in Louisiana. Uh, registration cuts off 30 days prior to the election. There's no automatic re voter registration. So like no voter motor or motor voter law there, you know, you have to file a separate form. So when you go to get your driver's license changed, you cannot update your voter registration. So where exactly are you going to sir you know mr fresh prince where are you are you aware of the situation in the state in which you decided to move the production and it's going to cost you 15 million dollars again i don't care there's no skin off my nose yeah because i don't think we get a, get as much money back yeah from what we spend when we give away the tax credit so yeah uh, th it's and this 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 uh this moral uh virtue signaling yeah. You know, we're, we're going to we're going to do the right thing. This is freaking Netflix. This is a, a, a streaming service that portrayed Jesus as a gay man. Uh, where's your virtue signaling on all these other things? I yeah. mean, the the, the, the the your programming. Look, the the Ozarks was filmed in my district right down the street from me. And it is one of the darkest most yes. immoral shows you can watch on television. Not to mention so, the last season was absolutely terrible. Yes. Well, I didn't even watch the last season because they stopped <laughs> filming it here. But that's neither here nor there. The, I mean, where how are you picking and choosing these things? You know, is are you doing it because you're riding the wave of, of public sentiment or are you doing it because it's actually the right thing? Are you trying to make a stand for what exactly? What was it in SB202 that forced you to go? Because all of the, the objective measurements of Louisiana's early voting process are far worse than Georgia's. Yeah. And look, I mean, the, 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 you know, as Scott mentioned, there is an economic impact, just like impact to this, just like, just like Major League Baseball, there is, you know, we can debate about exactly what, how much, but the people who would have been hired to work on this, small percentage of them will be Republicans. So, you know, to you're the not hurting that me, you're, right? Pardon? You're not hurting me. Yeah. You're hurting yeah. your own people. Yeah. So speaking of Major League Baseball, guys, I watched, uh, I was watching the game on Sunday. Well, I actually wasn't watching the game on Sunday, but I saw, I can't remember the name of the uh, the Phillies uh, player who was running it. He, he basically completely missed home plate 
he was out. Yeah. Arno had, uh, had tagged him. He was out. Uh, MLB replay missed that something happened. I don't know what they saw in New York, but they didn't see what everybody else saw. No. So he was, he was, he was safe on the play. They, they confirmed it quote unquote, confirmed it that he was safe uh, on the replay. Uh, it certainly see, and but, but just the same. Last night we saw uh, uh, in the first or second inning that there was a, a you know Marlins runner try to steal second. Uh, they called him safe. Then replay showed that he was out. Uh, I'm not a big fan of replay in baseball. I think you know just go with it unless you're going to overturn like every single call Angel Hernandez makes, and <laughs> he's like the worst performing umpire in Major League Baseball. How is yeah. that guy still employed? I do not like. He gets he he claimed he 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 actually filed a lawsuit a couple of years ago. So Angel Hernandez is is Cuban, and he filed a lawsuit several years ago claiming he wasn't getting assignments to like the World Series and All Star. I forget. I think it was the World Series, or maybe in the playoffs generally. Uh, and they claim he claimed racism. It's like you were you were you were statistically the worst umpire in baseball. Right. Yeah. I mean, how do you claim racism when you you see the baseball players on the field? I mean, they're not exactly homogenous. They're from yeah. all over, different races, different backgrounds. You know, they're different countries. Baseball is the least racist sport in the world, you know, next yeah. to probably soccer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, how do you claim racism in baseball? I, I mean, yeah. they, we, this is a sport. That I was hires, I was, I was hires talk- interpreters for their players. So they can make sure they understand each other. I was talking about MLB replay and I brought up Angel Hernandez just as a joke. Yeah, I mean, here, 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 okay. here we, here no, we I'm are, yeah. <laughs> here we are, uh, but, but no, so, uh, but Angel Hernandez suck sucks. Please, please retire. Uh, but, but no, I mean, it, but, no, it's cause he sucks. Um, oh, I thought you were just racist. No, no, not at all. I'm, I'm <laughs> not at all. Uh, anyway, <laughs> Now, now I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> the replay stinks. It, 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 yeah, it, well, it, Major League Baseball's use of instant, instant replay stinks, and we were we were talking about this before we hit record. And mm. you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, NFL seems to have a decent re, uh, replay system. I've took never them years though. They did take them years. I don't watch basketball, so I have no idea what the NBA's looks like. Uh, you know, I know college football has a decent one. <clears throat> it certainly seems that like other sports are doing this better than baseball. Yeah. No, I think that's right. I'd, I'd be interested to see. Uh, and I, I'm, I, I have no idea. This is just, you know, just an anecdotal observation from watching all these sports. There's a, there's, you know, it's, it's, it's reasonably frequent that a call is overturned in the NFL. It's frequent, you know, not uncommon for a call to be overturned in, in the NBA or even in college basketball these days. There, there's, there seems to be an understanding among the officials in those two sports that it's a fast-paced game played by really big, fast, athletic people, and uh, they they can they might they might miss it. Yeah. So I, I think yeah, but I don't. My my sense is that baseball doesn't often overturn the call on the field of the umpire, uh, and uh, and well, so I that I think that's what contributed to why I, they. I didn't. just thought it was a bunch of Phillies fans in the booth. That's all. <laughs> I mean, they, it could they, be. I mean, that, yeah, that's always possible. I imagine they use the same standard that the NFL and every other sport uses. There has to be, you know, incont- incontrovertible evidence that, right. You know, the plate, the, the umpire, the, the official or the umpire got it wrong. It's like, what other than the fact that his foot never touched the plate or his hand, no part <laughs> right. of his body ever yeah. touched the plate. Like what other proof do you need? Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was I mean, a really bad one. That, I mean, that, that was just, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, it, and look, it, it it was decisive in that um, you know it was it didn't end the game at that moment because the Braves did have an opportunity. Yes, they had an opportunity to come back, but what a momentum swing uh, and what a gut punch when you think you've you've gotten the third out and instead you're down by a run. Well, well, and that's and that's the thing. I I, I think uh, you know I the the problem I have with this because a lot of people are saying, well, this is the first couple of weeks of the season. You know, and, but like the, the so, you know, this is, so it, w- it shouldn't matter right now. It's the first couple yeah. weeks of the season. The Phillies, the Philadelphia Phillies are the Braves NL East rival. Yep. It's going to be the Braves, New York Mets and Philadelphia Phillies going at it all year for, for either the for either first place or that, that wild card spot. Yep. And you know, it, that game, when it's all said and done come September could, could make the difference. Absolutely. It could. Absolutely. It could. 
one of the draws for me in baseball is always the human aspect, right? And, and the, the robot umpire is coming. So I, I, I'm not going to be a Luddite about this, but well, let's just all hope they're not programmed like Angel, Angel Hernandez. Uh, well, <laughs> wouldn't you, wouldn't you rather have a robot umpire than Angel Hernandez? <laughs> oh, hell yes. <laughs> so, but that's kind of the argument is let's take the human element out of it. But I think one of the beauties of baseball is the human element, the, the, the potential for error in the, in the umpire and what they see and what they perceive happen is on the field. Um, and there's a political aspect to it, frankly, you know, uh, you have to be nice to the umpire. You know, he, yeah. you have to respect the authority of the umpire. You don't want to make that guy mad because he might not give you the corner on that particular strike. You know, not to question any specific person's integrity. I don't want to get sued um, like Paul Laduca did for $500,000. <laughs> but the the human element is what makes the game wonderful. Is yeah. it, it, the, the, the players have to execute perfectly and the umpires have to as well otherwise they don't get the big assignments and they probably shouldn't continue to to call the games i think it adds drama to the game i mean to have everything on an instant replay or robotic strike zones they you know it, it takes a certain element of of the game the, the beauty of the game away from me and I, I really hope that that this can be used as an opportunity to say look it's just slowing the game down you're worried about game times anyway. Let's just get rid of it because you're not, it's clearly not affecting the outcome of the game the way that you thought it would. You're just doing it because yeah. you said you needed to do something about making sure the calls are right and like every other sport. But the reality is you're just messing things up. It's, 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 a, it's a catch 22 because you, because I tend to agree, because I'm a purist when it comes to baseball, you know, mm -hmm. it, but I think Scott and I disagree on the designated hitter. hitter. But um, no designated hitter, period. Oh, you, so you don't like it either? No. Uh -uh. Okay. Then there was somebody else I disagree with about that. And I forgot who it was. Uh, but you remember a couple several years ago, you had that Det uh, Detroit Tigers picture, a Galarraga. I can't think of his first name yeah. who had it. He had a, a, I don't think it was in, I don't think it was, I don't think it was a perfect game. I don't remember. But definitely. It was a perfect no, game. It was a perfect, okay. Perfect it was yep. a perfect game. Yes. Yep. It was a perfect game. So he, and you know, it was two outs in the, in the top of the ninth. He had this ground ball. It's bobbled a little bit, tosses it over. The guy was clearly out, clearly, out. clearly out, not even it was he I think they had him by a full step. Yes. And yeah. the umpire calls him safe yeah. on replay. Ideally, that would have been that would have been overturned. That, See, I think I think and this is another reason I think and the NFL has it right for most of the game. You it's it becomes a strategic part of the game. You have a certain number of challenges that you can use. Yeah. And so you don't. Yeah, so same play, like if that had happened in the third inning, you don't you don't challenge it, all right? It's a bad call. You get over it. You move on. You have six innings to make it up. Yeah, but but then, you know, then then the replay takes over in the last couple minutes of the game when it's really important. So, you know, there's, there's ways you can reform this, I think, that, you know, make it a, a strategic part of the game so you're not challenging every play and you're not having to review everything. Football but, is different, though. You you know the the penalty if you get it wrong is you lose a timeout. So yeah. there's nothing like that in baseball. There's no equivalent to a timeout in baseball. There's no clock in baseball. That's so, true. So it's well, a, it's a different altogether. Well, you know what? Something baseball does have that other sports don't have. That is an antitrust exemption. Oh yes, that's, <laughs> that's true. true. <laughs> and that's I'm true. I'm moving to this topic against my better judgment because I <laughs> I am uh, Senator Mike Lee from Utah is a friend of mine. So. But I know he is joining forces with two people I cannot stand. That is Senator Ted Cruz and Senator Josh Hawley uh, to to take away baseball's antitrust antitrust exemption. And I despise Josh uh, Josh Hawley with every fiber of my being, simply because he wants to break up everything. Um, <laughs> it doesn't matter what it is. And Ted Cruz, uh, I, I showed you guys this earlier. Uh, this is my current reading. Uh, and, and, and there is there is that guy uh, really loves himself some some ted he, he did yes he i have never heard someone love as much ted love ted cruz as much as as former speaker john boehner but but that said senator mike lee is is uh is a thoughtful politician uh who is in cycle in 2022 and i suspect that this is the reason he is doing this uh but, but that said he is exploring getting rid of baseball's antitrust exemption scott you're the one who flagged this, so I'm going to let you take it from here, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I mean, antitrust exemption is allows baseball to do all kinds of uh, of things um, that ordinary corporations don't get to do. And the, the so whether or not it's good policy, the question I would have for the two of you is, 
is this the politics of retribution? Is this the right time to bring it up? Is there ever a wrong time to bring it up? Should they have it in the first place? I, I've always thought baseball shouldn't have antitrust uh, exemption. I don't know why they ever got it in the first place. I don't know what the history is behind it, mm -hmm. but they should be subjected to the same laws as everybody else. There shouldn't be a carve out for them. Now, that being said, I really don't like the politics of retribution. And mm -hmm. Mike Lee and Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley very clearly have stated their motivation for this is the removal of Atlanta's all-star game, yeah. which is why this is a Georgia related issue. So I know he's your friend, just like Jeff Duncan's my friend, Jason. So I know it's uncomfortable for you to talk about, but what do you think? I mean, is he, is, is it oh. a good policy? Is it a bad policy? Is it the right time? Wrong time? It is bad policy and it's the wrong time to do, to do something like this. I, and I don't know the, I used to know the history of this, but I've kind of, I've forgotten over the years. I, I remember reading about it when I was in like high school or something like that. Cause I was, I played <laughs> baseball when I was in high school. Uh, and I remember reading about it cause I thought it was interesting. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, look, no, it's clearly, clearly not good policy. It is the politics of retribution and retribution um, in politics is, uh, I mean, I'm not saying there's never a good time for, because there are occasionally times when you want to get some measure of retribution, but you do, I think you do that by winning uh, more than anything else. And, and, yeah. and, and that's the way you get retribution is by being successful. Right. Uh, and, and, and I don't think you do that by, by targeting uh, a, 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 an entity like major league baseball that has done something with which you disagree. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I the motivation behind it is, is bad, but the policy outcome would be good in my opinion. So I don't know that I don't I don't know that that's the case. I mean, I, I Major League Baseball has done a number of things that I disagree with over the past several years, including shrinking the size of the minor leagues, because uh, that's there are small, small towns that have minor league baseball teams, which is, is a source of jobs and income mm -hmm. uh, for those towns. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, but like at the same time, like getting rid of the antitrust exemption, I don't think is going to be is going to do that, do that much. I mean, I my my the the thing I can immediately say, like, you know, getting rid of the antitrust exemption would theoretically mean that other, there would be competitors like, you know, compared to like, yeah. you know, who, what we've seen, what, yeah, who, cause like every time everybody ever tries to come in and take on the NFL, they ultimately play six games and they're yeah. done as a league. I mean, the last serious competitor we saw the NFL was the USFL and guess who screwed that yeah. up? <laughs> Donald Trump. Yes. Wah, wah. <laughs> wah, wah. <laughs> and we have come for full circle. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> And with that, we're out of time. <laughs> we are. We are. Uh, thanks, uh, everyone, for for watching and or listening, depending on which medium uh, it, from which you're getting this content. Uh, please go to peachfunded.com. Check us out there. Please download, like, subscribe. Uh, you can like and subscribe. Well, I guess you can like and subscribe on 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 YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, but you can also subscribe and download on uh, Apple Podcasts, uh, otherwise known as iTunes. So please go out there, go go look for Peach Funded Podcast. Check us out. Tell us what you think. Leave a review. Leave us a rating. Tell Scott that it's all going to be okay. That the Reds, the Reds are going to have a good season this year. They're seven and three, bro. They're seven and three. <laughs> doing better than the doing better than Braves are. But you guys yep. are you guys are not in as, in as a competitive a, a, a division as we are. And they lost their best pitcher. Yeah, we lost our best pitcher, bro. I yeah. Mm, it, listen, I'll take a seven and three start anytime. <laughs> there, there, there have been there have been years where on april 15th i knew the reds were done for the season wouldn't it be so. funny wouldn't it be funny if i just stopped stop recording right now so he couldn't get that last word in <laughs> love you guys bye <laughs> have a good rest of your week we'll be back next week bye Peace everybody out.